Okay, today I'm going to cover the physics paper 6, the alternative to practical. And this is for the CIE IGCSE. And this is for May, June 2018. And the paper code here 0625 slash 62. So this is a second variant. All right. Let's give it a go. So let's begin. Question number one. A student is determining the density of water. She is provided with a plastic cup shown in figure 1.1. A. She draws around the base of the cup. Her drawing is shown in figure 1.2. From figure 1.2, take and record measurements to determine an accurate value for the diameter dB of the base of the cup. All right, so let's just look at that cup. Get that up on the screen as well. There we are. So for the diameter, we're going to want to measure across the full width of that circle there. That's the diameter d. In this case, db. Now I measured that on my printout and I get a measurement of 4.8 centimetres. Now, don't worry if you didn't get exactly 4.8, maybe you get 4.9, maybe you get 4.7. If you print it out on a piece of paper, it's possible that your result could be even further away than that. That's okay. Sometimes, especially if you're printing it out, your computer will resize it to fit the paper. But 4.8 is the answer they're looking for in the uh, mark scheme, and 4.8 was a measurement that I actually got on my printout here, which is printed on letter size paper. Two, the student places the cup upside down and draws around the rim of the cup. She determines the diameter dt of the rim of the cup, and that's 7.2 centimeters. Calculate the average diameter d of the cup using the equation d equals db plus dt divided by two. So let's just put that in, it's only worth one mark, so we can just write the answer straight in if we want, but it's always good to just write down your working out so that you're comfortable with it. So d is then 4.8 plus 7.2, they're both centimetres divided by 2, and that'll give you a value of 6.0 centimetres. There we are, we've got two significant figures, two significant figures, so I'm just using two significant figures here. So 6.0 centimetres. And always check to make sure that the units are actually already written in. If they're not, you have to write them in. B on figure 1.3 measure the vertical height h of the cup. Now I measured that and I get a value of 7.8 centimetres. And again, check the units are written down there. And that happens to be the measurement which is given in the mark scheme. So that's absolutely fine. Don't worry if you get 7.9, 7 7.7, 7 it's okay. Uh, your computer may well have resized it, or your printer may have resized it as it was printed out. Unless you're sitting there with a physical old exam uh, from a previous sitting, then it's entirely possible it might be out by a millimetre or two. So don't worry too much about that. Part 2. Calculate the volume V of the cup using the equation V equals 0.785 d squared times h. So let's just write that down. That's 0.785 times 6.0 squared multiplied by 7.8. There we are. And that gives me a value of 220. There we go. C. The student fills the cup with water. The mass of the cup with the water is shown in figure 1.4. So where is it shown? It's shown right in here. Determine density rho of water using the equation rho equals m over v. So density is then going to be given by the mass, 232 grams, divided by the volume we just calculated, which is 220 centimetres cubed. And that will give you a value of 1.05 grams per centimetre cubed. There we are. Now at this point, 1.05, we have to remember to write in our units here. There we go. Part D. Suggest, with a reason, a part of the procedure A, B or C that could give an unreliable result for the density of water. Okay, well, you know what? There's a, a few difficulties with each of them. If I go for part A, um, I've drawn the base of the cup. I measure that, but I don't take into account the thickness of it, the thickness of the cup. So, well, how can I calculate the density of the water in the cup if I'm including the, the, the volume of the cup in the calculation? And there's a couple of other possibilities too. I could choose B, where we measure the height of the cup. Why? Because it's difficult to measure the height in practice. Or I could choose part C, because the mass of the cup is ignored when the whole thing is weighed. It shows you the mass of the cup and the water, so we're including the mass of the cup and the density of the water. 
Part E. The student pours the water from the cup into the measuring cylinder. Draw a diagram to show water in a measuring cylinder, show clearly the meniscus and the line of sight the student should use to obtain an accurate value for the volume of water. First of all, let's just draw the side of a measuring cylinder and uh, we'll put little graduations in it. There we go. It's not perfect, but that's okay. Now let's draw in some, some liquid, some water. What you can see here, I'll just highlight it. So I'm very clearly drawing in the meniscus at either side. All right, now how would I measure this? Well, at 90 degrees, here we go. Over here, I would have an eye. That's it. So I'm looking at the scale at 90 degrees. Now, as it says, show clearly the meniscus. I'm just going to label meniscus. I can probably get away without doing that, but just to be clear. Question two. A student is investigating the cooling of water. Uh, figure 2.1 shows the apparatus being used. A. The thermometer in figure 2.2 shows room temperature theta r at the beginning of the experiment. Record theta r. So we have to take a look at our measurement here. There we are. Let's see where that's coming out. That looks to me to be 23 degrees Celsius. One mark, be careful, make sure that you're putting in the units because there's no units listed here. So always be careful, always check that the units are in the question or in the answer. B, the student pours 200 centimetres cubed of hot water into the beaker. He records the temperature uh, theta h of the hot water at time t equals zero and immediately starts the stop clock. He continues recording the temperature every 30 seconds. Uh, the readings are shown in table 2.1. Part 1. Explain why the student should wait a few seconds after placing the thermometer in the hot water before taking the first temperature reading. Well, that's actually because if you've ever put a, a, temp a thermometer into hot water, you'll know it take a little while to reach the maximum temperature to get into thermal equilibrium. So let's just write that down. There we go. Part 2. Complete the column headings in Table 2.1. Well, the time is measured in seconds and the temperature theta is measured in degrees Celsius. And Part 3. Complete the time column in Table 2.1. Well, we know the readings are taken every 30 seconds, so let's just fill that in now. 4. Plot a graph of theta and degrees Celsius on the y-axis against time in seconds on the x-axis. You do not need to start the y-axis at the origin, but the value of room temperature theta r must be marked on the y-axis. If we remember, theta r was 23 degrees Celsius. Alright, so the range that we need for temperature is, give or take, about 20 degrees Celsius all the way up to 70 degrees Celsius. Now, we have got these big squares uh, which are 10 squares wide let's see if we are lucky we can just see one large square 10 small squares so one large square um, equals 10 degrees celsius and that means that i would need uh, 17 minus 20 is 50 degrees celsius is the range five squares on the y-axis Let's fill that in. Label the axis. There we are. Now, there is a little jump between the zero section and the start of the scale proper, so we put in a little jump in the axis there. Now we're plotting time on the x-axis. So what we can do is we can put, let's see, how about we use every 30 seconds equals the one large square. And of course, always remember to label the axis. Now the x-axis is starting from zero, so let's label that as well. 
Now all the information we need can fill in a graph. So our next step is to plot these points onto the graph. Okay, so plot the lines as best you can. Uh, make sure they're accurate and as close to the actual values as they need to be. So you want to try and get it within half a square of the actual value. So take time to do that. Make sure you're plotting them correctly. Now, what you need to do is put in a line of best fit. It doesn't ask you to do it anywhere in the question, but you should always be putting in a line of best fit. It's up to you to decide whether it should be a curve or a straight line. To me, that looks like a curve, so let's put one of them in there now. There we go. Now, if it does ask you to draw a line, maybe it'll ask you to draw a straight line of best fit or just a line of best fit, and it's up to you if they just leave it ambiguous or vague for you to decide whether it's a straight line or a curve. Part C, draw a horizontal line across the graph to indicate the value of room temperature as shown by the thermometer. All right, let's do that now. There we go, and what I'm going to do is just label that room temperature. Theta R and 23 degrees Celsius. No need to do it, it doesn't say it anywhere, but just to make sure I get the mark and they don't miss the line that I've drawn. Part D, state two precautions you would take in order to obtain accurate readings in this experiment. Well, number one, read the thermometer at 90 degrees, perpendicular to the scale. And second one, well, we touched on it earlier on, wait for the thermometer to reach the maximum temperature before you begin. There we are. E, a student plans to repeat the experiment using the same thermometer and same volume of water. Suggest two changes to the apparatus or procedure that would increase the rate of cooling of the water. Okay, well bigger temperature difference would work, so a higher starting temperature, that's one way to do it, or a colder room temperature, they would both work. There we are, so higher starting temperature for the water, colder room temperature, they would both work. Other things you could do, you could use, uh, use a metal beaker, that would give off heat more rapidly, it wouldn't be like an insulator. You could use a fan, uh, something with a bigger surface area, those things would help as well. Question three, a student is determining the focal length of a lens. Figure 3.1 shows the apparatus used. The student adjusts the position of the screen until a clearly focused image is formed on the screen. On figure 3.1, measure the distance V between the centre of the lens and the screen. Right, I added that and got 5.8 centimetres. Just to be clear, if you're out by a millimetre or two, don't worry, it's possible that the entire thing got resized as it was printed out, unless you're using an old exam paper, in which case try and look at it a bit more carefully and see where you went wrong. Figure 3.1 is drawn one-fifth of the actual size. Calculate V, the actual distance from the lens to the screen. So it should actually be 5 times bigger. So 5.8 times 5 gives me 29.0 centimetres. There we are. And both of these ones, look, the units aren't provided in the answer. You have to write them in. 3. With a clearly focused image formed on the screen, the actual distance of the centre uh, from the centre of the lens to the illuminated object is 20 centimetres. Calculate the focal length F1 of the lens using that equation there. Okay, so we've calculated V and we're given U. U is here. All right, so in that case, F1 is actually 20.0 multiplied by 29.0 divided by... Uh, let's be clear here, though. Let's pause this briefly and let's look at this. I've written 29.0. Should I have done that? Mm, I'm actually going to say no. I'm going to say no because what I have here is two significant figures and one significant figure. I don't see that I should have three significant figures there. Two I can go for. So let's just take that out. There we are. That's much better. Two significant figures multiply by one significant figure. I should have two significant figures there. All right. So let's come back here. 29, not 29.0, divided by 20.0 plus 29. And these are both centimetres. The top one centimetres squared because it's centimetres times centimetres. The bottom one is centimetres. So that will give me a value of 11.8 centimetres. 
Now, here's a tricky one. I've got three significant figures and I've got two significant figures in my question. Hmm. What's interesting is if you come down a little bit further, here we go. Let's look at that. Here I've got three significant figures and the rest of that question here is asking me to combine the two. So I'm actually going to write this as three significant figures. I would still get the marks if I wrote it as two significant figures, but it makes the next part of the calculation easier. Part B, the student repeats the procedure in A using a different uh, distance U. She obtains another value for the focal length F2. Calculate the average value F A of the focal length of the lens using F2 and your value for F1 uh, in A3 and use your answer, give your answer to a suitable number of significant figures for this experiment. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit because as I said, this could be done to either set of either three or two significant figures. So let's have a look at what happens. For three significant figures, what do I have? Well, my average will be 11.8 plus 12.2 divided by 2, and overall that will give me a value of 12.0 centimetres. I'm going to write that in. Again, be careful. Make sure you're writing in the units here. Now, what if I only had two significant figures? What happens then? Well, let's look at it. My average would be, uh, the 11.8 would have been written as 12. 12, not 12.0, just 12, plus 12.2 divided by 2. So that would give me 12.1 centimetres. But if I'm trying to enforce this two significant figures here, then I should really be enforcing two significant figures in this answer. And that would actually be 12 centimetres for two significant figures. So either way, I'd end up with 12 centimetres in this section here. Part C, the student states that taking more measurements improves the reliability of the value obtained for FA. Suggest additional values for you that you would use. Okay, well, he's done 20 centimetres. What I think the way forward would be to do 25 centimetres, um, 30 centimetres. Mm, let's go 35 centimetres and 40 centimetres. There you go. That's four values. They're pretty good. They're all different and they're all bigger. Why am I using bigger values? Well, if I use smaller values, then the error gets larger. So if I go from 20 centimetres down to the next measurement of 10 centimetres, the error increases. Much bigger error. Twice as much. So it's better to get bigger in this case. And I'll just do it every five centimetres until I hit 40. There we go. D. State two precautions you would take in this experiment to obtain accurate readings. Well, you know what? If you ever tried doing one of these experiments, it's pretty difficult to see. Do it in a darkened room. Something else that's difficult is to measure from the center of the lens over to the wall, or the, or the point where it focuses. So at that point, mark the center of the lens on the lens holder. There we go. Two very good things that will work well. Question four. A student is investigating whether the distance that a toy truck will travel along a horizontal floor before stopping depends on its mass. The following apparatus is available to the student. A ramp, box to support the ramp, as shown in figure 4.1. A toy truck, a selection of masses, other standard apparatus from the physical, physics laboratory. Plan an experiment to investigate whether the distance the toy truck will travel along a horizontal floor before stopping depends on its mass. Right. Okay. So when your plan, explain briefly how you would carry out the investigation. State any apparatus you would use that's not included in the list above. State the key variables you would control. Draw a table or tables with column headings to show how you would display your readings. You are not required to enter any readings in a table. And uh, here we are, diagram 4.1. Okay, pretty straightforward. We've got a ramp, we've got blocks, and we've got the floor. And a truck will roll down the ramp and onto the floor. And of course, we'll probably put our masses onto the truck. So there's a couple of key things we want to control there as we're doing it. Let's do a very quick idea about what it is we're interested in here. So we want to see how it varies, how the stopping distance varies depending on the mass. All right, so some things that we're interested in doing then, first of all, we're going to want to use the same truck. We 
we're going to want to keep the same angle. We're going to need something to measure the distance. So either a ruler or a tape. And I think another thing that's going to be quite important is to make sure that we're always releasing the truck from the same position. So we can actually compare the results. There we go, that's going to be our key point. So I think it's just going to be a case of doing those things. Letting the truck roll down the ramp, measuring where it stops, distance to the bottom of the ramp, and then adding more mass to it and seeing what happens. So in fact, there we go. That's going to be a key point. So we're going to repeat this as it happens. We're also going to want to weigh, weigh the truck. So we can record that information. All right. So we're going to want to set up the equipment, the same as it is in figure 4.1. And we're going to want to use, say, at least 10 centimetres in height of the blocks to lift the end of the ramp. And what we're going to want to do is mark on the ramp where the blocks touch it. And we're also going to want to mark on the floor where the ramp ends. And as long as we've got those two marks, we can make sure that every experiment will have the same angle theta. So we have to keep that same angle. That's going to be very important as well as the experiment progresses. OK. So let's try and write that down. So first things first, set up the equipment as in diagram 4.1 and use at least 10 centimetre blocks to lift the end of the ramp. Mark on the ramp where it contacts the blocks and mark on the floor where the ramp extends to. All right, so set up the equipment as in diagram 4.1, use at least 10 centimetres of blocks to lift the ramp, mark on the ramp where the ramp contacts the blocks, and mark on the floor where the ramp extends to. And this means that we can reset the ramp to the starting height and angle at the start of each run. So the other thing we're going to want to do use the same truck throughout the experiment. So let's write down uh, the key points of our experiment. What we want to do is well, step one, mark on the ramp at the start position of the truck and you're going to use this for all runs. So next thing we're going to want to do, uh, part two, ensure the ramp is in place, uh, the angle is unchanged and place this truck at the start position. Step three, release the truck and measure the final distance from the end of the truck using a measuring tape. And then four, what we want to do, of course, is add mass to the truck. And then you're going to want to repeat steps two, three, and, and four for several runs till you've got, say, at least five or six readings and record that information. All right, so that's four, add mass to the truck, measure the mass of the trucks and masses using scales, repeat steps two to four until at least six readings uh, have been gained, record in the table below. Now looking at that, I haven't measured the initial mass of the truck. So let's do that now. Put that in point one. There we go, put that in step one. Measure and record the initial mass of the truck. That covers me there. Okay, so let's draw the table we're gonna use. So there we go, we've got the mass of the truck in kilograms, distance traveled along the four in meters. Um, that just about covers it. I'm gonna put some information down there uh, to see the additional apparatus I need. My control variables.
there we go. So I've put down additional apparatus, scales and measuring tape, uh, control variables. I've got the height of the ramp, the angle of the ramp. I'm using the same trolley throughout. I guess maybe the only other thing to do is say plot a graph of uh, distance uh, travelled on floor against massive truck. Don't need to say that, but just in case there's any marks for suggesting a graph, I'll put that down. And there we are, plot a graph of distance travelled along the floor against the mass of the truck. I've got my control variables, additional apparatus. I've got a series of steps I can repeat. I think that's me finished that, and that's, uh, that's a pretty good answer. All right, hopefully you found that useful, and that's helped you out a little bit. If it has, please feel free to like and subscribe. And uh, there we go. Have a great day.